so glad you're all here. Thank you for coming. I'm really excited about our speaker. Um, as a school principal, 28 years into my teaching career, I'm often asked what concerns me most about children's lives these days. One of the first things that comes to mind is children spending too much time on screens and the impact that it's having on their physical and mental health. I see firsthand children who are not getting enough time outdoors, children who are not socializing with others, children who are not getting enough sleep or physical activity, even children who are not attending school because unfortunately they are up all night on devices and can't get up in the morning. I even hear disempowered parents questioning their right to take the devices away from their children or wondering about the extent to which they're allowed to limit their children's access to screens. I know if you're here this morning, I'm already preaching to the choir, as they say, but I cannot express strongly enough that as parents, we must get involved and help our children navigate this issue. And for most of us, we grew up in a time where it was not an issue. So we need some guidance. We have to put limits and boundaries in place in order for our children to be physically and mentally healthy. I know that devices can provide us as parents a much needed break from the demands of a busy household. Trust me, I'm a parent myself. I understand. But if we've noticed that our children are spending several hours on screens each day, if screens are preventing them from going outside and playing and being physically active and socializing face to face with other people, if screens are affecting their ability to get enough sleep, if they get distressed or angry when you try to put limits on their screen time, if our family time in the car at the dinner table doing chores has been replaced with screen time, it is essential that as parents we get involved and put some boundaries in place. The time to act is now. You can imagine, given my passion for this topic, how thrilled I am that our wonderful school council decided a year ago, a year ago we booked our guest speaker, to do their part in solving this problem by recruiting Michelle Nogueira to speak with us today. For the past 31 years, you must have started when you were 10. <laughs> Thank you. You're right. uh, you know, being somebody as myself. Uh, Michelle was, has worked with continuum of care in the addiction field. She has achieved many certifications in gambling and addiction. She also is a registered social worker with the Ontario College of Social Workers and Social Services Workers. Michelle is currently working at the Homewood Community Addictions Services. And this is interesting. Has your title changed over the years? Yes. Yes. So <laughs> her title is she um, is working at the Homewood with problem gambling. And now the title has expanded, I assume, to technology over use counselor. That's how real this is. That wouldn't have been a job 15 years ago. Michelle is also an instructor at Wilfrid Laurier University. In 2017, Michelle initiated and launched a balanced technology management committee in Guelph. The BTM, as it's called, committee brings together a variety of stakeholders that are passionate to ensure that children and youth receive a balance between activities that promote healthy development with technology use. I'm lucky enough to sit on this committee, and that's where I met Michelle. We are working together and striving to support our students as they work to have a balanced approach to technology in their lives. We are so fortunate to have Michelle here to share her expertise on a Saturday morning with us today. Please give me a warm Mitchell Woods welcome for Michelle. Thank you, everyone, and thank you, Moira, for that wonderful introduction. I think between um, what Moira shared this morning and the October Wolverine newsletter, I don't know if you even need me today, because <laughs> um, she covered a lot in the newsletter and also in the introduction about kind of where we're what we're up against with technology. So thank you. It's um, I have mixed emotions about being here today, mixed emotions in a way that I'm heartwarmed that so many of you are here today, and there's some level of heartbreak that so many of you are here today, which tells me again that this is a concern for all of us. 
So I'm hoping today I'm going to provide a little bit of information, some tips, some tricks, some strategies um, that hopefully you can leave here today and really start to have some thoughtful and deliberate conversations about technology and what that could or couldn't look like in, in your home. So as we said, I work at Homewood Health. How many people um, know of Homewood? Hands? Excellent. So I'm just going to tell you a little bit about Homewood because a lot of people think that we're just located on Del High Street in Guelph, Ontario here. Um, but we have expanded all across Canada. Um, so Homewood Health has been the Canadian leader in mental health and addictions for over 130 years. Um, we are known for a variety of services including organizational wellness, employee and family assistance programs, assessments, outpatient and inpatient treatment, recovery management, return to work and family support services, all customized to meet the needs of individuals, families and organizations. We offer a variety of training programs specifically designed for the safety and well-being of staff, clients, caregivers and organizations. Um, it always makes me proud of where I work to realize that we have such an incredible um, history. And just a bit of a disclaimer, um, the purpose of this presentation is to provide information about mental health and addiction. The content such as text or graphics or other material contained in this workshop or presentation is for information purposes only. The information provided today is not a substitute for medical or professional advice. And if you feel that you need professional or medical advice, please consult a qualified healthcare professional. So what I'm going to do today is I'm going to go over uh, a little bit of the welcome and introduction. I'm going to give you an overview um, of what, about what's going on around tech and screens. I'm going to talk about uh, some of the facts, some of the warning signs to look for. But the majority of, of my talk today is going to be a little bit more focused on tips and strategies because that's what we want. Right? I, you know, I, stats, numbers, it's a problem. Uh, I'll talk about how much of a problem it is, but really what people are coming here today is you want to leave with something um, that you can actually maybe start working on as a family at home. So I'm going to focus mostly on that. So I just want to do a little bit of a tech survey. Um, so just as I, I yell out the different devices, if you could just do a show of hands about how many people own these particular devices. So an iPhone, uh, Android, some type of mobile device. And feel free as I uh, ask those questions to look around um, to get uh, an understanding of where we're at. What about an iPad, some type of tablet device? Okay, okay. What about some type of console at home? I'm talking, oh look, at, I don't even have to go through any of them. Um, everybody knows what they are. So we got the, um, the PS, we've got the Nintendo Switch. They just came out with a new version. Um, we've got, uh, what, Xbox, Xbox One. So people are familiar with those. Okay, how many people have a, um, a laptop? What about a desktop? Oh, a lot of people still have desktops. <laughs> okay, what about a wearable device? Oh, look at, look at, look at even showing, show and tell over there, a wearable device. Okay, what about um, a voice controller like an Amazon Echo, a Google Home? How many people have voice control? 100%. Yeah, I, <laughs> do you have them all over there? <laughs> <laughs> um, and how many people have VR, virtual reality systems at home? So a, a, a few of you have that as well. So obviously when I did that survey, um, many people have multiple devices because I saw hands up for a lot of those. And that, that's the landscape, that's the culture of today. We are a very wired generation. So this is where some of the issues or the problems or the conflicts arise. 
So I'm going to play a video. Um, it's, it's by the Holder and his family, and it's called We've Got a Problem. Um, and it's just a fun way of looking at kind of, uh, I think that um, everyone here to some degree will be able to relate to something in the video. Um, and before I uh, get the video going, I really, really want to thank Ross. Ross, can you stand up? Um, Ross has been absolutely exceptional because my presentation was on a PowerPoint which wasn't all that compatible with the Google Chrome uh, software and uh, Ross quickly um, edited slides before this and fixed things and um, it's interesting, I talk about technology a lot, uh, obviously as a technology overuse counselor, um, but uh, when it comes to, uh-oh, what's going wrong or what's going amiss with technology, I am so thankful that youth are in the audience because they always troubleshoot for me. How many of you at home, when there's any problems with technology, will ask your kids? Yeah, yeah, exactly. So just sit back and watch um, the video. Some families can. <laughs> I really like the video because it's a, a fun way of looking at it, but it, it also really points out that it's not just our youth and our kids today, but we as adults are also trying to figure this out as well. Thank you so much, Ross, for staying for the video. <laughs> So with that information, um, Mark Prensky did a lot of work around this whole concept about digital natives versus digital immigrants. Um, and this is where a lot of conflict can happen in our families or with, um, with our children. So our children are digital natives. They were born into the generation of computers. They speak the computer language. Um, a point Ross could fix everything for me very quickly. Um, so they're very, very um, familiar and an, a great understanding about all things technology. They often, with digital natives, they multitask, they're very quick paced, they like text and graphics and those types of things. Um, the digital immigrants, which most of us are, we weren't born into the generation of technology, but we've developed an incredible 
fascination for it and have kind of adapted to it. But often the digital immigrants are much more single focused. They like to take one step at a time, um, more paced. They like talking um, as opposed to texting and social media. So there's a real difference between the digital natives and the digital immigrants. And obviously when, like with anything, when we speak different languages, it can lead to a breakdown in communication. Um, so there can be more misunderstandings, more inter misinterpretation. Um, often kids will say, well, you were born in a different generation. You don't understand you know, what it's like today. And, and often we don't, right? And also our kids um, don't understand kind of the generation that we came from as well. So that becomes a lot of where some conflict can, can happen around not understanding um, the digital natives and, and the digital um, immigrants and, and the disconnect. This is kind of where it's at today for, for youth. Um, and, and you know, it's a cute little graphic. But I mean, this is, this is a play on uh, Maslow's hierarchy of needs, which has been around since I think 1943, if you can believe it. Let me just double check. Yeah, the Maslow's hierarchy of needs has been around since 1943. As digital immigrants, we were much more focused on that survival um, aspect, right? The basic living needs. Um, the digital natives today, our children, our youth, they're much more focused on things like Wi-Fi and battery life. How many people have hear, heard of FOMO? Fear of missing out? There's a lot of fear, anxiety-based technology that, that's happening. Um, so that when we talk about that, that FOMO, there's a few things happening. Kids today are worried about a, that they're not going to be close enough to a charger, that their battery's going to run out and they're not going to have access to a charger, that they're going to miss out on something that's happened, they're going to lose their signal. Um, those are the things that are much more of a value or a focus um, often with today's youth, which is way different than what it was like for us. So in that, that Holderness video that says we've got a problem, why I like that is because it also helps us take a look at of ourselves as adults and, and as parents or caregivers. Um, because as you can see up there with the stats, 7% of adults in Ontario um, reported a moderate to severe problematic use with electronic devices. So it's not just a youth or a kid thing, um, it's also adults that are struggling to figure it out as well. So this was a survey that was done through CAMH um, in 2015 who, who looked at um, kind of where do adults fit. And as you can see from that slide, 19%, um, the largest area is within the 18 to 29 year olds. What's it look like for our youth? So here's, again, CAMH did um, this research as well. So screen time and problematic video gaming, 10% of students um, play video games five hours per day. So when you think about that, when school ends at three or four o'clock, you would think five hours per day, that's the rest of the evening, right? Till 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock, nine o'clock, doesn't leave much room for homework, socializing, family time, hygiene, extracurricular, offline activities, all of those other types of things. And it's interesting, about one in eight students have issues with video gaming. That's about, you know, 12%. I think it's about 107,000 students in Ontario between the ages of seven, grade seven and 12. So CAMH does this Ontario Student Use Survey, and this is where that information is. One of the longest running surveys. It's been going since about 1977. They do it every two years. Um, and a few years back, they started to add video gaming and social media as questionnaires. That was never, um, that was never thought of years ago when they started it. Just like my title has changed over the years to not only specializing in problem gambling, but also with technology. 
and social media. 86% um, of students visit social media sites daily and one in six students spends five hours a day on social media. What are the most common social media that um, youth are on? You just shout it out. Snapchat, Snapchat that's, and Instagram. Those are the two biggest social media um, apps that, that are, today's youth are using. How many in the audience are still on Facebook? That's more of an older generation. I say that kindly, <laughs> but that's what the youth say. It's like no one's on Facebook anymore, mom, you know? Um, so definitely uh, Instagram and, uh, and uh, Snapchat. Interesting to break it down to differences, and, and it's probably not surprising either. Um, what we see with males, males are more likely to still engage in physical activity. Um, males are more likely to get enough sleep. Um, they're more likely to engage in gambling. Um, violent behavior, they're more inclined to play video games than their counterparts. And um, they're more likely to show signs or symptoms of, of video game problems. With, with uh, females, um, again, not, not surprising, fair or poor uh, physical health, um, not being as active, um, seeking mental health counseling for unmet needs, uh, fair or poor mental health, symptoms of psychological distress, experiencing some form of trauma, suicide thoughts or attempts, uh, experiences again with social media because girls are more likely to be on social media for bullying or cyberbullying, and uh, more hours on, uh, as I said, on social media, more symptoms of problematic technology use. Anyone surprised by that, how that kind of unfolded? Makes sense? So lots of issues are coming on the heels of technology. So screen time, um, as Moyer said, the impacting all different areas in a person's life. So we've got it affecting mental health, we've got it affecting physical health, we've got it affecting um, family relationships, we've got impact on um, interpersonal skills and, and delayed social skills, um, lower academic achievements, and um, overall reduced productivity, not only with school, but with basically anything that people engage in um, and, and work as well. So we can see that it's having um, impact on many, many different areas of, of one's life. And these are some of the symptoms um, to kind of keep an eye on um, with yourself I and mean, even with your own children. So we see lower interest in school achievement. Um, these are students that may have been um, higher achievers, more interested in achievers. Um, doing homework, those types of things, just not as interested in, in, in performance or achievement as maybe they once were. Often they can feel anger or frustration when not allowed to access the technology. So when the battery life runs out or they can't get a signal or they're not near a charger or that as parents we, uh, we set parental controls, um, there can be more uh, tension or more conflict related to that. They can feel depressed and anxious so when not able to access technology or when they play a game or when they're on technology for a prolonged period of time. Sleep difficulties, often um, they get their days and nights mixed up, um, poor sleep habits, uh, they, more restless sleep, they wake up more often in the middle of the night. Um, and also the decreased um, in, in personal hygiene, just not uh, caring about how they look and how they're presenting in their self-care. And here's some other ones to break down uh, that slide a few ones. Uh, some of the physical, we see carpal tunnel uh, syndrome, we see headaches, things like that are happening, a lot of migraines, um, impact on vision and eyesight. Um, aggression towards um, those who try to prevent um, the screen or set limits or try to take it away. Uh, they may lie about how much time they've been on. Um, and sometimes, again, this may be that they're lying deliberately or it may be they've lost track of time. Because it's easy, even us think about how easy it is to go down the rabbit hole with our technology. You know, you'll click on a link and then it takes you to another link and another link and then it's like, how did I get here? Um, so it's really easy once we're on, all of us, 
um, to lose track of how much time we've been on. And it seems to go by very, very quickly. Uh, declining invitations. So they may not be as interested in hanging out with their friends. They may not want to go out and do as much um, yeah, outside. They may um, have invitations to do things, but say, no, I'm, I'm not interested. I don't feel like it. Um, and usually that's because they want to spend, again, more time, as much time on technology. And they limit their time with family and friends. And again, if they have chores and responsibilities, not just related to school, but they can neglect household tasks as well. So those are some things to keep an eye on. Um, again, those things relate to us as adults or as parents, but also to keep an eye on with our youth. It's so concerning and, and, and it impacts uh, so much of uh, an individual's life that in, on June 16th, um, 2018, I believe it was, let me just double check, I don't want to get that, yeah, June 16th, 2018, the World Health Organization made a really bold move and um, wanted gaming disorder added to the 11th classification of illnesses and diseases. So to me that says, that's a, a really bold and big statement about where we're at and how concerning uh, screen time is, particularly um, their, their focus was on gaming and actually um, call it gaming disorder. And they look at three particular criteria. And these three criteria that are on this slide, they actually are criteria that fit for any type of addiction, whether it's gambling or technology or substance use. Um, is, is there a level of preoccupation? Is the person always thinking about it, thinking about the next time that they can get on, talking about it all the time? Like it's very much consuming them and it's the main thing that's on their mind. So they're always, even when they're off, they're thinking about what they could have done different, um, what they want to say next time, all of that stuff. There's a level, it's in their head um, that they're preoccupied with it. And then there's this um, increasing priority um, given as well. Um, so the extent of gaming takes over precedence over all areas in the person's life. It becomes the most, most important thing. And there's also impaired control. So like I said, they'll think about, I'm just going to go on for a little bit. I'm just going to go on for 30 minutes. I'm just going to go on for an hour. And you'll find that they're on there for way longer um, than they anticipated. And then all of that um, ends up kind of coming together with there's negative consequences. So it's starting to have an impact on more and more areas in the person's life. So moving on to some of the tips and, and uh, tricks and strategies that I really, really want to encourage. And again, when I go through this information, I'm not expecting that you're gonna take this information and run home and make like huge changes. Um, I actually would not encourage that. But I would encourage that as we go through things that you can do at home, that you walk away with some pretty easy or simple to do's that you can start doing fairly quickly at home. And more importantly, I'm really hoping that this, this chat today leads you to leave here and start having conversations about it. It actually, the change or implementing some of the tips and tricks I'm going to talk about starts with us talking about it talking to our families about it, talking as caregivers or parents about it, um, figuring out what it could look like, how best to navigate it. I mean, every family here is different and your circumstances are different. So you'll have to kind of take that into consideration. But I really want, um, my whole idea in coming out and doing community talks is let's talk about it. Let's start talking about this and let's start figuring it out together. Because if you look around the room, we're all in the same boat. Like we all are struggling and are here because we want some information. So some of the things that as parents you can do, again, it's, it's looking at that gap between the digital natives and the digital immigrants. Part of it is having those conversations, asking questions at home. 
what game are you playing? What app are you on? What are you doing? What are you doing? Or can you show me what that's like? Um, what do you like about Instagram? What do you like about that particular video gaming game? What, what's interesting to you about Fortnite? Um, what about Apex? Um, starting asking questions about what kids are doing. Sometimes I'll see families in my office um, and when they do the intake for our services, our intake worker gathers kind of what they're doing on technology or screens, like whether it's social media, whether it's games, um, and often it's the parents that are providing some of that information. And so when the youth comes in and I meet with them, I'll, see, I'll say, so I see that you're playing Zelda, and they'll say, like, 10 years ago. And it's like, oh, well, <laughs> that's what I have in my notes. Um, often families aren't even aware of what's going on or what types of activities are going on online. Because again, we can conceal it, we can hide it, it can happen behind closed doors, it can happen very privately. So just asking, like being, um, asking questions about what they like and what they don't like, becoming informed and educated about technology like all of you are today. Um, and, and letting them teach you and learn. Uh, kids, it's interesting, um, not only do they uh, really like watching YouTubers or people on YouTube and are streaming, they like watching other people play games, which I find would not be very appealing to me and my generation, um, but they, they often like when their parents or when friends um, watch them play as well. So it's a really good, way to start conversations by just watching them play and, and kind of meeting them at where they're at and helping understand what technology looks like for them. It's also important to kind of look about the benefits. So it's not all about doom and gloom with technology. The whole session is about a balanced approach to technology. In no way it's not about let's get rid of it or let's not have it. It's how do we live and develop healthy habits and a healthy lifestyle, including technology and with technology. Um, so yeah, understanding that there's lots of benefits to, to, to technology. Understanding even some of the language or the slang terms. Um, I know that uh, a couple, I think it was last week or something, I walked by my son um, who's 15 and uh, our, uh, our, his um, computer is in the living room. Um, great visibility, really annoying, but great visibility. Um, and I'll, I'll, I'll say like, oh, GG. And his friends will go, did your mom just say GG, which is good game um, in uh, gaming terminology. Um, so even, I'm, I'm not saying you have to be schooled with all the language, but it's helpful to even know because they speak in all this different language. It's digital natives, right? They're speaking in a different language. So it's good to even kind of understand some of the slang terms. Also, it's important to understand what their motivations are for technology. And I'm going to look at a slide that talks about that. Um, and also always kind of thinking about mental health concerns. Um, so in addition to looking at issues around screens or technology, it's also what else is going on here for my, my, my youth? What, what else is going on for my child? Starting to ask and maybe unpack some of those things that also may be going on at the same time. I love this slide. This is by uh, Dr. David Walsh. Whoever tells the story defines the culture. Do you know the story in your child's favorite game? or in your cat's Nintendo. I'm a cat lover. <laughs> so Dr. Doyne um, did a book um, that I would recommend. It's called Hooked on Games. It's an excellent book that really unpacks um, everything that you could always wanted to know about games and kind of were afraid to ask. But I often recommend this to families because it helps you understand what are those unmet needs and what are those motivations that are going on underneath the surface. It's easy as families that we get frustrated with the games and with the technology, but really kind of looking at it through a different lens and trying to figure out what needs are being met in, in my child 
with this because that's important if we can identify what those unfulfilled needs are what those motivations are then we can we're better in a better position to find other things that maybe we could do to meet those needs or look for other supports that could help meet those needs so in Dr. Doyne's book, um, Hooked on Games, and it's interesting because he's a doctor, I think, I believe he might be a, a neuroscientist or a cognitive neuroscientist, but he's also in recovery from gaming. Um, and he writes the book with great information, but from a lens of his own personal experience with um, having problems. I believe it was with the, the game EverQuest, if, I, if I'm remembering correctly. So these are some of the things to think about. Um, technology or screens can be um, an escape from reality, right? So stressors that are going on, um, whether it's at school or um, within the family or wherever those stressors, sometimes it's just an escape or a way to avoid or deal with stress that may be going on. Also, it can satisfy this sense um, of curiosity. It is the World Wide Web. So there's so much stuff out there. So there's a lot of curiousness and a lot of things to look at. Um, it provides often a sense of purpose. It gives meaning, it gives direction, it gives purpose, um, it gives focus or task. Um, it can heighten a sense of invincibility. So when folks are playing games in particularly, it can give a real sense of ego and power and um, when they win the games or when they conquer or when they achieve certain levels, um, it gives this incredible sense of power and invincibility. I'm untouchable. Um, as I said, it feeds the ego and a sense of self-esteem. It offers companionship. Um, it can be very social, even though they're online socializing with their online group or their online friends, it can be an incredible um, opportunity for companionship or teamwork. It satisfies challenge, competition. Um, it gratif there's gratifying to be a, a leader, especially kids that may have um, other mental health issues. Um, in, in the gaming world or um, behind uh, the social media or behind the screens, they can be anybody that they want to be. Um, so it can be a real um, impactful way to kind of, um, for them to lead or be a leader and get respect from, from a community of gamers. Also, um, there, there's a lot of obviously sexual stuff in the games and online and pornography and things like that, that our youth today are being introduced to those images and, that, and those graphics a lot earlier um, than they really need to be. And, and that's something to consider as well. They're very curious and very exploratory, but there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of that fulfillment and that fantasy within um, screens as well. And then there's that meeting the need for love and approval, um, especially that sense of belonging or that sense of acceptance. So it's really important when you're looking at you know, the games and the screen time to really consider there may be a lot more going on than maybe what we initially thought. And that these are some of the needs that may be being met. And it's important to walk away with a lens with looking at it from, from these different things. Because as parents, we get frustrated and think, I just want to get rid of that stupid game, or I'm just going to throw out that device, or you know, I'm taking it away forever, and you're never going to have access to it again. And I get it as a parent of a 15-year-old who loves technology. But we also need to look beyond and realize that there may be other things going on, and we need to consider that. It's not just an easy solution about getting rid of it. This is probably the million dollar question that I get asked is, how much time is too much time? What are the limits or how long should they be on? Be on? How many people have asked that? You know, how much time is too much? What's the appropriate amount of time? Um, how many people know um, the Canadian Pediatric Guidelines about time? Does anyone, some people do, okay. I often suggest about time because as I said, it's really easy to lose track of time. I really suggest that people get clocks, old fashioned clocks. <laughs> 
like a clock in the room, um, a clock above the um, console, a clock above the computer, have an actual clock. I mean, on a lot of the computers, there is time. You can see it at the bottom kind of right-hand corner, but it's so itty-bitty and small. It's really helpful um, when we move into some of the other strategies about talking about how much time is too much. We don't know that unless we're going to actually keep track of it. So getting clocks. I had um, one uh, fellow, he was actually um, an, an older adult, he would use uh, a timer on the stove and also those egg timers. He would set those types of things to kind of keep track of time. With devices nowadays, there are a lot of features within, um, like iPhone has a tracking log, Android, um, pretty much all things you can figure out tracking things to help you with that. Um, but keeping an eye on the time um, is important. And again, it's not just about time, it's also about impact because you may um, stick with the, the guidelines that we're going to go over, but even if you're sticking with the guidelines, if it's still having a negative impact on the person's life, then it's not just about the time factor, but it's about how is this um, wreaking havoc in the person's life, or what are the negative consequences? So we want to not only consider time, but we also want to consider the impact. Because as I said, someone could be playing and using screens within an appropriate amount, but they can become very emotionally dysregulated. There can be a lot of anger. There can be a lot of stress. Um, so that may mean that that person needs less time on technology than even what's recommended. When we're talking about, you know, kind of keeping an eye on time, we're talking about recreational screen time. So these are also called entertainment screen time, discretionary screen time, non-essential uses of screen time. So this is the entertainment or the screen time um, that is not related to work and it's not related to school and it's not related to homework or their IEP or using their Google Chromes for those types of things. This is when all that is said and done, keeping an eye on monitoring the recreational aspect of screens. As you can see, uh, timely with coming up with Halloween, you'll see uh, a couple of the pumpkins. Uh, as I said, my son's 15 and he likes gaming. Um, you see the CSGO pumpkin and also um, big fan of uh, Pokemon. I don't know if there's other Pokemon fans, but I'm a big fan of, um, of Meowth there on the other uh, pumpkin. So here's the uh, screen time guidelines that's recommended through the Canadian society. And again, it's just taking this information and, and keeping it in mind. So for uh, children less than two years, they're recommending no screen time. So for two and under, no screen time. For two to four years old, um, under one to a maximum of an hour or one hour a day. And they often encourage that even within that hour um, that it's for purposeful, educational, beneficial type of screen time. And then look at that number for five to 17 year olds. Two hours or under per day. Now, it's okay to be honest here, because I'm gonna do a show of hands. How many meet the two-hour guideline if you have a child between five and 17? Oh, I am so impressed. How many people exceed that? Yeah, you know, whenever I go out and do these talks, and again, it's not about judgment, most people exceed the two-hour timeline. That, 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 that's okay. Uh, as I said, I'm not hoping that you'll walk away and go, Michelle said two hours, we're gonna get to that two hours. Why this information is helpful is because they're recommending two hours, and if our children are on for, what was it, five hours a day on social media, um, five plus hours a day, if they're on for six, seven, eight, some of the people I see are on, um, they double my work week, which is 35 hours. I see youth that are on about 70 hours a week. Um, and so when I, when I provide that information, 
I just want you to be armed and have the information. I don't expect that you're going to run home and everyone's going to adhere to that. Um, but it helps us really gauge those conversations and it helps us understand what needs to change in our families. So if two hours are recommended and my child's on for six hours, maybe I need to kind of come down a little bit. Not quickly to the two hours, but maybe gradually come down um, because that's helpful. Um, to all of a sudden leave and go two hours is what's recommended, that's what we're doing, that's a bit of, um, it's not that fair, right? If, if it's been more lengthy and all of a sudden we're putting those parameters in place, sometimes we need to do that a little bit more gradually and thoughtfully as opposed to all at once. Um, it'll be less conflictual, there'll be less conflict related to it, um, but it's something to keep in mind. Surprising, is that uh, the, the recommended guideline surprising? As I said, most people I see and I speak with, um, it's, it, there's usually a handful that actually um, are following it. So again, it's not just about the time, it's about the impact too. So these are some things that, uh, that I'm hoping that you'll leave here and, and consider. And again, even small changes around screen time is really impactful and really significant. So we're often you know, suggesting that there are guidelines, that it's just not a free for all and no one's monitoring it um, or there's not kind of some time limits or parameters put in place. So I've got a sheet up here that might be helpful. And this is through um, the problemgambling.ca, the Problem Gambling Institute of Ontario, and it has how to make healthy choices related to video gaming. Um, and it talks about homework, household chores, personal hygiene, all of those things before time spent gaming. Um, there's a saying that says um, uh, screen time is the dessert after the meal. And it's actually one of my favorite quotes, screen time is the dessert after the meal. The dessert is usually a small portion, the meal is, is the main portion, it's easy in our families to get those things mixed up, right? So we're really looking at screen time is the dessert after the meal. So when all is said and done, when the homework is done, when family dinner is done, um, when we've had time to catch up through the day, when all those things are done, then there's time for, for maybe some screen time or, or some video gaming. And it's also recommended that, um, that you have red and green zones, and I'm going to go over what maybe you could consider as some of your red and green zones. It's also important, as I said, to set actual time limits with a clock, and it's also important to encourage breaks. Um, because our youth lose um, track of time, it's really important that they take breaks. So after 30 minutes, um, take a break. Um, take a break, go do something that's not technology related or screen time related, and then come back to, um, to the electronic device. So taking frequent breaks instead of prolonged play, even something as simple as that. Because the longer they sit there, um, the more that that can get, um, the, so not only the time but content of what they're doing can kind of raise more aggression in, in, in today's youth. So we really want to chunk it into segments. And ideally, um, it's really helpful to set the guidelines or have the conversations before the devices come into the house. Um, because it, once the toothpaste is squeezed out of the tube, it's really hard to get it back. Um, so it's easier to set this up and have those discussions before you bring a, a device or bring a new device into the home, that there's kind of communication or a family chat about it. And encourage not only self-monitoring, but again, our role as parents and caregivers is to monitor uh, as well. It's not like the George Foreman grill that we just set it and forget it. Um, that if we're gonna put things in place, we actually need to be monitoring it, checking in with it and evaluating it. And I know as a parent, it's tiring. I know it's tiring. And as a, you know, having a 15 year old, even with the work that I do, left to his own devices, 
he would be on there for extended periods of time without me having to say, Noah, you've been on this time, go take a break. Noah, you have 15 more minutes, you need to start wrapping it up. Noah, go do something that's not tech related. Noah, put down the screens and do a magic trick or juggle. Um, without that inter intervention, and it gets tiring and frustrating, but this is a whole thing that we're all trying to figure out how to navigate, and, and it really does require um, us being actively involved in it, because if we aren't, it creates even more problems to try to kind of pull in the reins or put the toothpaste back in the tube. So, and I know families are tired. I know that you're busy and I know that everybody's got lots of stuff going on. Um, but it's really important that we, that we keep the conversations going and we, we kind of monitor this for our children and also for ourselves and our own tech time. As I said, there's lots of monitoring things that can help you with this. Of course, there's the good old pen and paper. And up here, we have lots of different handouts. So there's a whole power off and play handout that covers a lot, like a summary of a lot of what I've talked about today. And actually a pen to paper tracking log around using it at home for screen time. Um, and so you could track it through the week, you could track it on the weekend, um, or you could use some of these different um, devices on your phone to track. So um, you can install on mobile devices, so there's Checky, and Checky can be for um, Android or iPhone, it's compatible with both, and basically all it does is every time you do a screen unlock, it tracks that and it'll send you alert the next day and say, you've opened your screen um, 110 times yesterday. Um, so it gives you an idea about how many times you're opening your screen. It's a pretty basic one. And then there's Moment, which is good for the iPhone. And of course the iPhone now has come out with their own iPhone tracker. So you can enable and, and, and do that as well. And it's got great features. Um, lots of uh, lots of good stuff to do. Um, there's also Onward is another um, app that you can track utilization. Um, quality Time is another great one. And this one that you see up is on, um, I have three of them on my phone. My husband always laughs that a lot of my phone utilization is looking at the tracking devices. Um, <laughs> seems ironic, but this one on mine uh, is space, and it, if I can set limits about how long, and if I exceed those limits, it sends me these little messages that go, it's hard for you to see them there, but it says, Michelle, you've spent a whole 120 minutes on your phone already today. You know you'd feel better if you did something else or got off your phone. Um, hey Michelle, most people are happier if they use their phone less. So it's neat um, that it can send you little messages or little prompts to again help us keep track of time. So I would encourage that if you're, you do have um, mobile devices or phones to put some of these, engage some of these tracking devices. Um, I think you'll have fun with them. I also think um, for us as parents, it's a really interesting thing to kind of see for ourselves as well. And it's also important to seek out other resources that help you kind of figure out um, what's going on and what information could be helpful or um, maybe hurtful around uh, technology. So there's some different websites up there and some of them are on the Power Off and Play handout out here as well. Um, so seeking helpful resources that give you information about game ratings, age appropriate content, privacy and safety, because as I said, it's not just about time, but it's also about the impact and the content that we're looking at. Um, how many people have heard of the Entertainment Software Rating Board, the ESRB? Oh, excellent. So the Entertainment Software Rating Board, um, they rate different games. Um, so they give it an age rating, but they also have content descriptors. So there's three points to the ESRB rating. They give an age range, so what, would, what game is appropriate for what age. 
They give a content descriptor, so in, in it, and it's on the front of the boxes of games that you purchase, it would say something like um, blood, violence, um, comic, you know, those types of things. And then there's also the interactive element, because kids can play some of these games online as well. So there's kind of three pieces to the, um, the ESR rating. But going there, um, they have a mobile app too. And I use these all the time. So if Noah wants anything new, a new game, um, he knows mom needs to do her due diligence, which means I've got to go to the ESRB rating. I've got to go to Common Sense Media. I've got to go to uh, another website up there is Binary Tattoo that has an incredible app resource that tells you every app and gives pros and cons or positive negatives about Instagram, Snapchat, Kick, tip, you know, TikTok, like all of those. It gives you kind of an age rating, but also gives you um, pros and cons or positive and negatives on binary tattoo. And again, these are on the, um, the Power Off and Play handout. But it's good to gather that information and then make a decision about yay or nay around the games based on gathering more information. As I said, ongoing communication is so important. And these are some of the red zones that I'm really uh, hoping that you may consider. Um, and, and again, they're, they're, these could be easy um, things to implement, um, as opposed to the Canadian Pediatric Society suggested two hours and I'm all of a sudden going to do that. These could be on our way to make changes. Um, so interesting, when our kids are passengers in vehicles, um, so obviously we know we can't text and drive, but passengers in vehicles means that when we're taking them to and from school, when they're dropping them off at their friends, extracurricular activities, whenever we're going anywhere, we have, a, we've got an audience there. And because families are so busy in this day and age, there's not a lot of time to talk about the things that we need to talk about and to kind of keep our thumb on the pulse with, what's go with knowing what's going on in one another's days. So while they're a passenger, so when I pick Noah up from GC, it's like, well, how was your day? What did you do? Did you get that task back? You know, did you talk to that girl you liked? Um, he wishes he could jump out of the car when I start to get to those hard hitting questions, but I've got a captive audience at that time. The other one is um, one hour before bedtime, starting to unplug, log off, power off, get off devices about an hour before bedtime. Why that is so important is that um, you notice devices have a lot of blue and white lights. The blue and white light actually mimics the sky, which tells the brain to wake up and be alert. And so if our kids are on devices right up until the time that they need to go to bed, they're logging off, getting off the game, getting off Snapchat, and trying to go to bed, it's gonna be hard for them to get to sleep. It's gonna delay their ability to get to, to sleep because that bright and blue lights on all devices, um, it interferes with the natural production of the sleep hormone, melatonin. So melatonin naturally gets released into the body and that the, the screens hijacks the natural production of that. So when melatonin um, gets released, we gradually start to prepare ourselves for bed, just like as the sky and the sun starts setting. Um, so that's important to log off an hour before, um, before bedtime. Um, often not having uh, devices in bedrooms. Um, especially during sleep time um, because it's such a shiny thing and our kids are like moth to lights with those with the the colors so having um, that opportunity to not have screens charging in the room at night can be a really helpful thing and then I'm going to talk a little bit about meal times we also encourage times to unplug for all of us there's some great unplug 
great unplug signs that I would encourage people to take. There's I unplug, we unplug, um, there's little name tags that our family unplugs. And these would be great things to take away and start creating those unplug, those digital detox moments, those times to power off and play. Um, those would be great things to kind of get those conversations going. I love this comic because you see all these devices and then it's like, and just what do you think you're doing? Because there's a book, like not on a, on a Kindle reader, it's an actual book. And we really encourage no devices at, uh, during mealtimes for any of us. Um, there's research that was done that said the mere presence of a device at a dinner table interferes with human bonding and human connection. So even though we may not be using the device, just its mere presence there can be distracting or disruptive. So even if you leave here today, and if you're not already doing that, adopting that as, as part of the strategies. And we're almost done, and just to, uh, a few last slides. Really assisting your children with other things to replace screen time. So if they're not going to be on screens, what else could they be doing? I suggest puzzles that are readily available, bins of Lego, um, models. It, it doesn't really matter what it is, but having other things. So when you say you need to take a break from technology, your time is up on screens, go do something else. And then they're aimlessly wandering for that something else. Having kind of these types of things at the ready that they can, um, they can, they can um, partake in. And looking at things that are no cost to significant cost, like simple and basic things. Um, getting kids physical activity, as Moyer said in her introduction, there's not a lot of kids that are going outside as much as we used to. We used to be outside until the street lights um, came on and then that was our cue to go home. So just getting physical activity, getting kids outside, dealing with nature, dealing with being bored. You know, I go to the, any doctor's office or any place and you look around the room and everyone's on screens. I often wonder, what did we do before? Maybe we talked to one another. <laughs> or maybe we just sat in our boredom or maybe we just thought or, you know, tuned into ourselves. So really looking at physical activity, activities that there's a social interaction, um, fun and educational and family. And we uh, need to be healthy role models for all that. That's, again, one of my big takeaways today. And again, it is the World Wide Web, and there's so many really neat things about it. And Mark Griffiths has done a lot of research, and he said, oh, you know, technology and screens can get a really bad rap, and it's not all negative. As I talked about some of those unmet needs that are met, these are some of the things, and this is in the parent, um, the modern parent guide um, that you can actually get online. Um, it talks about there's problem solving and teamwork and learning, um, math and language skills. Um, there's so many positive things around screens and technology and games and all of that stuff. So it's not just doom and gloom and negative. It's about also understanding the benefits of it. It's about that balance piece, balancing time on tech. These are two tools that are online that I would really encourage. So if you go to healthychildren.org, the first tool is what we call a media time calculator. And what it does is that you put in your child's name and their age, and it sets up a 24-hour clock, um, it, more of a kind of a spreadsheet, but a clock. It automatically populates in how much screen or how much sleep would be recommended for your child depending on the age. So it automatically would put in seven hours. It also automatically puts in one hour of physical activity a day. So that already goes in, and then all the rest of that 24 hours is in screen time. And then we start, we have school on there, so we click on it, six hours of school. It comes out of the, the screen time. 
extracurricular activities, we click on that. It never takes the time away from the one hour of physical activity or the sleep time, but it gives you an idea about what it looks like, what that calculator looks like in a day, and maybe where those changes need to happen. The other tool on the same site is a media, uh, family media plan. And everything I've talked about today, you can go online and you can create your own plan with red zones, green zones, digital citizenship. You just click on buttons and you can print it out. And those are great things to do as a family. And so you, it doesn't come up with, um, the cat of, with this software, but it says to be in your child's um, memories tomorrow, we need to be in their life today. And I love that, to be in their memories tomorrow, we need to be in their life today. So as I said, I'm really encouraging that there's some takeaways from today. Maybe it's helping you look at some strategies that you can um, start talking about and start implementing. As I said, there's lots of um, sheets up here with uh, a lot of the summary of what I've talked about today. Um, so we're kind of all in this together, you know? So um, yeah, let's keep the conversations going about uh, tech and, and, and our families. Thank you very much for having me today. It was a pleasure. Um, great to see so many people out that are interested and passionate about it as well. So thank you. You're welcome. Thank you so much, Michelle. I know as a parent of a 15-year-old and a 12-year-old, I'm going to There's um, like a worksheet here actually for your kids to fill out as well. So if they want to be looking at how much time am I spending on screens and so on. And those name tags so you can set some goals as a family. So there's all sorts of wonderful resources here for you. So do have a look on your way out. And we do have one of the uh, resources translated into Cantonese and to Vietnamese as well. So if that is helpful to you, you can take a copy of that. So that wraps up our morning. but. I have to do a few thank yous because we can't pull off this event without a lot of people helping. So my team this year um, was Stephanie and she was in charge of all the food this year. And Joan, who you saw with, uh, with the children, that's a huge, big piece. And it was, uh, in the past, we actually showed a movie, um, but in uh, sort of consolidarity with the topic, we thought it would be better not to have them sitting in front of a screen. Um, so she pulled together crafts and games and all sorts of stuff, so we hope your kids had a good party. And then Sarah was our point person who did um, pull together all those, um, made sure the teachers put up their clubs and contacted all of our community groups to come. So I also want to say thank you to all of you for taking a morning and spending it with our families. We really appreciate it. Um, and to our principal, Mrs. Galt, Meyer Galt, and to Sarah, they help me a lot in like just making sure all my communications are getting out, the sign outside goes up, um, helping me with the contacting the teachers and getting photocopy stuff and all those kinds of things. Um, I need their help, and as well as Lisa, um, who maybe a lot of you have met in the office, she helps me a lot with those details. Um, Ms. Groudon helped us with the uh, garbage stuff. That may seem small, but it actually does take some effort to pull all that together. So she was in this morning setting up our garbage stuff. To Ms. Stronick for my technology. She came in yesterday after school. Um, so my husband, who's actually filming this for us this morning. So if you had to go out for your kids or take a bathroom break, you missed some stuff, or you're like, oh, I didn't bring something to write down, it's all going to be up on a YouTube um, video. It'll probably be a few days again to get that up, but it's going to be, there'll be a link on the school website, so if you want to watch it, or if there's parents that you know that couldn't come and want to see it, you can access that there as well. Um, our pancake flipping team, they were here at 6.30 in the morning. So thank you to them. 
Um, we also had hot chocolate this year, and I have to pull out my device because I wrote the last name on my device. It's uh, the Tabordas. They came, um, I saw them at Open House, and their son, uh, Diego, said, you should have hot chocolate at the pancake breakfast. I was like, oh, that's a good idea. So I wrote it down, and then I got an email the next day from his mom saying, I would love to do that. So thank you for donating it as well. Um, I also had a bunch of kids come last night, and a few parents, they took about an hour to set up all these tables and put paper on. Um, all the babysitters that are taking care of our kids. Um, I'm gonna name the groups. So College Heights is here, West Willow Village, Wealth Family Health Team, People Information Network, and Immigration Services. They support us every year, so thank you for coming. And then of course, finally to all of you for taking the morning and coming, and I hope that you uh, had a good social time with your family without screens, which is nice. And, um, and that you can take some of this away. And I would encourage you, like, share how do you deal with all this stuff. There's all sorts of tips and tricks. Like, we have something at my house called screen time money. My kids actually have to physically give me this money that they made that has 20 minute, 30 minute, 10 minute, and they, they give it to me, and they only have a two hour amount of it. So that's one of my little tips. But I know there's so many out there. I love that summer contract or something you had up there. So that was awesome. All right, so in just a minute, we'll bring your kids back. Um, if you could take, before the kids come, on your um, tables is an envelope like this. Inside is an evaluation, and there should be pens in there. If you could take just a couple of minutes to fill that out, let us know how we did. And if there's a topic that you would like to know more about that we could present next year, please give us your ideas, because that is very helpful to us. So if you could just take a minute to do that. Um, and then, I guess Amaya wants to say something too. So while you're filling that out, I will hand her the microphone. Of course, Amaya wants to say something. Um, this event does not happen without our school council. Amanda is our chair, and she listed a lot of other people. If you are sitting here today and you want to connect with other parents in this school that are positive, enthusiastic, and um, anxious to make this school better and better, please feel free to come out to school council. Even if you can only come one or two times in a year, don't worry, we'll give you a little job to do if you show up once. Now, we're, we're really happy to have you, and it's a good way to connect. It's on, is it the first Monday? For, our next one is November 4th. It's at the live, in our library at 615. Um, it's very positive and happy. You might, you might have had a negative experience with school councils, not at this school, in your past. It's not like that. It's great. I really look forward to them, and then we laugh a lot, we get a lot done, and we really, really encourage you, even if you just want to meet people and don't have time to do anything else, just come and meet some people. Thank you so much to the school council. You guys are amazing. I feel very blessed to have this group of people supporting our school, so thank you for that. Um, I think that's it. The kids are coming back, so the quiet will cease. Have a great day.